Good evening, everyone. It's Matt Ferrer from Ontario Soccer. Uh, we're just uh, getting a few people coming in a little later, so we're going to um, wait a few minutes and then we're going to get started. Thanks for your patience. Good evening again. So we're going to start the webinar now, and uh, so I'm going to introduce here Dr. Joe Baker from York University, who's done a number of research studies in the area of talent of identification. And he'll be leading us tonight through this presentation. So I'm going to pass the baton to him. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. Um, I'm happy to be here. It's, I love talking about this talent stuff, especially with coaches that are responsible for putting it into action. And so um, we're going to cover a lot of material tonight. Uh, hopefully you find it interesting. But if you have questions or if I'm going too fast through something, um, just uh, put a question in the uh, question box and, and Matt will get that to me. And then hopefully we'll have a bunch of time for, um, for questions at the end. So my first slide is really what is talent and and I always put this question out to coaches because how we think about talent is important it's um, it affects how we approach athlete development it affects how we look at performance on the field it affects the discussions that we have in our groups uh, when we think about selection and those kinds of things and um, our research group has been looking at athlete development and talent identification for about 20 years now and um, sports all over the world, um, different sports systems, different um, uh, skill levels, different um, uh, Paralympic, uh, Olympic sports, soccer, handball in Germany. We've been everywhere trying to figure out this equation. And um, the thing that makes it so exciting is it's the cornerstone of what sports scientists do. It's the cornerstone of what coaches do. And... Um, if you've been following talent, especially talent um, selection and development in sports like soccer and football, um, it's a pretty wild west uh, approach to this issue. And I'll give you an example. So this is a young 18 month old um, soccer player. Well, I guess we call him a soccer player from the Netherlands. And this was a YouTube video that um, was making the rounds about, I think, seven or six or seven years ago. Uh, have a look at this. So, so amazing, right? That 18 months old, that's, uh, we could probably all agree that's a pretty amazing performance for a kid at that age. What's, um, what makes this a, an extreme example of the concept of talent is that um, uh, a couple months after this video was gaining popularity on YouTube is uh, this kid was signed to a 10-year symbolic contract by a Dutch uh, soccer club. And so, you know, think about the implications of that for that child's development from that point forward. Uh, first, it assumes that what we're seeing there at 18 months is really talent and not uh, not practice and not pressure from parents and not just time spent on task. Um, but it also affects developmental outcomes from that point forward, right? If you put that person in a, a enhanced environment, you change the uh, likelihood of success. Um, you give them better coaching, you give them more opportunities um, that affects likelihood. The other thing is when we do that, we take a spot away from someone else. Uh, and that's what a selection decision is. It's about, uh, making an estimate of potential uh, for an individual. And a couple weeks ago, I was in the uh, UK working with the football association there, and, and they have an interesting perspective on selection. They say that um, in uh, as many instances as possible, we should delay that until the age of 15 or 16, because then biology is uh, equaled out, we, maturation is equaled out, and we're less likely to make mistakes when we do that. 
we're not doing that when we start selecting at 18 months or seven years old or, or, or 11. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about that today. In principle, talent selection should be a relatively easy um, exercise. We identify people who are at the far right-hand side of a performance curve and we select them to move on to the next level of development. And we do that subsequently all the way through the developmental pathway. And so in principle, it should be simple. Choose those with the greatest performance and we're capturing those people with the greatest likelihood of success. If we think about how we define these terms, though, um, it, it's it's going to be critical that we have a good understanding. So for most of us, I would guess that we would think about talent as something like this, a, a quality identified at one point in time that we can use to predict success at a future point in time. Uh, that's what we're trying to measure when we do athlete selection, when we try to predict the future for an athlete um, at some point in our developmental pathway. The process of doing that, where we try to predict the future, um, is, is athlete selection. And I'm careful not to use talent selection because we'll get into this a little bit later, but there's a lot of baggage that comes along with the word talent. If we think about this in terms of athlete selection, we might be on a bit more solid ground. But when we use that, um, and we have to make selection decisions about who gets to stay and who has to leave a development system, then we're talking about the process of athlete selection. This process assumes, one, that talent is a real thing that, that that makes sense from a conceptual and a, a you know an evidence-based uh, standpoint, which is probably true. It makes sense that populations vary and people have different potentials and all that kind of stuff. I think that makes a lot of sense. The second, probably more important assumption for us is that we have good measures of it, that we have good ways of, of capturing that potential. The next thing for us to define is um, this process of, de of designing a good pathway, um, giving kids the right kind of instruction at the right point in time, providing the right balance between training and competition, those kinds of things are, are issues related to athlete development as opposed to selection. And so after looking at this for the past 20 years, um, I can tell you without, uh, without hesitation that we know so much more about the right types of things we need to do to optimize athlete development uh, than we do about athlete selection. And so um, one of these things we have a really good understanding of, development, and the other we're actually, um, and I'll show you some evidence for this uh, in a few moments, uh, we're actually struggling uh, in, in terms of evidence to support some decisions. Why is this important? Well, um, the UK spent 20 million pounds, which is somewhere around 36 million Canadian dollars, not on building infrastructure or um, uh, advertising or supporting athletes that are already in the system going into the London Games. They spent 20 million pounds just on identification. Uh, and so that's a lot of money. You think about that uh, in terms of sports that are struggling for funding, what they could have done with 20 million pounds. Uh, we want to make sure that if we're using that kind of money to fund identification strategies, that we should be spending that money in the right place. Something that's maybe even more important is the cost of selection decisions on what it does to your most important resource, which is the athletes playing your sport. And so these are some data from um, U.S. basketball. So at any year, um, at any point in time, there's between four and six million youth in the United States playing basketball. If you want to go on to the NBA, you um, you obviously have to go to a high school that's got a basketball program. And so in um, the, the United States, there's about 18,000 high schools with basketball programs. So in a single selection step, we've gone from between four and six million kids now to down to about 360,000 kids by limiting who gets access to play high school basketball. Um, that's a pretty massive cut to our, our population of players. If you want to go to the NBA, you almost always go to a Division I basketball school. There's 346 Division I basketball schools in the United States, and that means there's about 4,500. Now we're down to about 4,500 players. 
NBA players are, are almost always um, products of the draft system. And so the NBA has a two round draft system, which selects about 50 college players each year to move on. Of those 50 players, only about 15 to 20, depending on the year we're talking about, only 15 to 20 go on to actually play even a single game in the NBA. And so from a talent uh, development and, and selection standpoint, we spend a lot of time and money focusing on these later steps in the development pathway. But really, the more important steps are the ones early on, the ones we're losing massive numbers of of kids and, and potential players by making selection decisions early. We could be forgiven for doing that if we were great at making those selection decisions and we had good levels of accuracy. And I'm going to show you some evidence to uh, indicate we, we don't, that those selection decisions, even when we laid, wait until later in development, are not very accurate. So the question I have for you is, Given how important those consequences are for deselection, um, how are you managing those risks and consequences of deselection? What are you doing not just to the athletes that are staying in your system when you have to make um, selection decisions about who stays and who moves on? What are you doing with the ones that are, that are having to leave? Because those are the ones that we, we rarely follow up with. We, we rarely give any attention to what they're doing in the system. How, are they still practicing? Are they still playing? Um, and so that's a lot of a uh, lot of human capital that we're losing uh, when we do that. For people that work in the sports system, we think about talent in a, a pretty unique way. It's about um, efficiency of, of resources. You know, it, it's it would be great to say we have enough uh, facilities and resources and and person power to say any kid that wants to play soccer can play, but the reality is that we have limited resources and that we have to make decisions. Um, uh, you guys, especially coaches, have to make decisions about who gets to stay and who has to leave. That's the reality of of uh, competitive sport, and so. How can the central question to the kind of research that we do is how do we make that process better? How do we make those decisions um, uh, more evidence-based, but also um, easier for coaches to explain to parents when a parent comes to you and says, you know, why did you cut my daughter or my son from uh, from the team? You can say with confidence, well, it was because we have these indicators and the likelihood is stronger for this person that we kept and lower for this person that we cut. Um, it's never going to be perfect. It's never going to be 100%. But if you have those evidence, uh, evidence and indicators, then it's at least something that you have um, that you can that you can stand behind. So, like I said, this is a question we've been looking at for a while now, and and really uh, very recently we started to explore and unpack this idea of um, how can sports science improve the selection process. So this is um, um, some data from a systematic re review we did. Um, if you're interested in reading the boring kind of science review, um, just shoot Matt an email. I'm happy to send you the copy of the review that came out in Sports Medicine a couple months ago. But essentially what we did was we were interested in looking at how much research is there on things like talent or expertise or giftedness in a sport setting. And because this concept is so central to what coaches do, what scientists do, and, and what athletes are interested in, um, no surprise, there was a lot of, uh, of, of evidence. There was almost 1,500 articles from uh, over the last 25 years that have looked at this, uh, uh, this type of research. The thing that made our systematic review different, though, was we were interested in looking at the highest quality evidence. So this is studies that have looked at um, research over long periods of time. So we said that, well, it had to follow or track athletes for at least a year. Um, it had to have um, samples of skilled players, but compared to um, lesser skilled players. So they had to have that comparison. So we actually knew that the difference was something that was related to the skill group being superior on an outcome than the lesser skilled group. And it had to go through the peer reviewed uh, research process so that it was not just somebody's opinion, but it was somebody's opinion that had been validated by the scientific community. And as soon as we put those criteria in, we go from about 1500 articles down to 20. Uh, and so think about that for 
the last 25 years of research for something that's so important, not just from a research perspective, but from a, what coaches have to do every year. We've got 20 studies that have explored this um, over, um, over a reasonable amount of time. And we said a year was the minimum amount of time. Well, if you're working with a, an under 13 or an under 15 athlete, you're making decisions about their future based on way longer than one year period. Most of the studies focused on physical or um, anthropometric body measurement type variables, um, with very few of them focusing on things like um, uh, psychological indicators or perceptual or cognitive types of things like decision making or uh, being able to read plays, uh, those kinds of things. Most of the studies were from, from soccer, which is great. Um, uh, soccer and rugby were the two most popular sports in these areas, but when we say there was uh, a lot of studies we're talking about six in soccer and five in rugby so um, think about the differences between the soccer system in the UK and the one we have here you could probably make a pretty good argument that those are apples and oranges and that the system in the UK has very little relevance to the kind of system that we have here in, in Canada and, and I, you'd probably be right. Almost all of those studies are from the last 10 years, and so that's great. We're starting to see more interest in this area, but um, uh, it's still a bit shocking that nobody really cared about talent identification and selection in sport until, uh, until the last 10 years. And then the other thing that was interesting was that very few of them dealt with determining the long-term accuracy of those talent ID decisions. Um, of the few that have looked at that, a couple of those studies have, have been from our research lab. But what the conclusion we're left is, um, is that coaches have very little strong or robust evidence for making talent selection decisions, but we're going to make it part of what coaches are expected to do uh, on a regular basis as part of their coaching practice. And so um, this is the dilemma that we're in. We have very little evidence to support the jobs that you guys have to do, but we're going to ask you to do those jobs anyway. making things even more complicated when we've looked at studies that have looked uh, that have followed um, talent selected individuals over longer periods of time to see how good those uh, decisions were um, the the evidence for these decisions is not very strong and so we did a study a few years ago that looked at the accuracy of the professional sports drafts that the uh, the nhl nfl nba and, and major league baseball have uh, for predicting future performance and it was a relatively simple analysis that we did we just were interested in how well the round that you were selected in predicted how many games you ended up playing at the professional level and so the reason we did this is because teams will have different strategies about what players uh, are expected to do so some teams in the nhl for example have uh, people who are just there to be enforcers or physical play um, but if you're, if you're filling the job that your coach has for you, you're going to play games. And so we thought, well, games played is a pretty good indicator of a person's value um, at the professional level. The evidence was actually pretty poor. Um, the, the accuracy ranged from 3% to 17% of the overall, so I'll get statsy uh, here for a little bit, the overall variance in the number of games played, we could account for about 17% of that with a uh, draft round, which means that that's not a heck of a lot. And what makes this even more interesting is these are people that are being evaluated at the adult level. These are college age, sometime uh, in baseball they choose from high school, but these are relatively late in the development pathway. And even if we wait that late to make decisions about a person's potential, we're still only accommodating between 3 and 17% of the variance, which is, I would argue, not very great. So the rest of the time I want to talk about how do we do, how do we improve? How do we improve the way we think about talent and the, and the way that we select? Uh, because, you know, you could look at this data pessimistically and say, well, why do we do these things? Um, the reality is you're going to have to do those things. And so I think it's much better uh, use of our time to talk about, well, how do we improve the models and, and the approaches that we take uh, when we have to do this thing that's part of our uh, part of our jobs as coaches. 
Well, one is um, recognize the limits of our knowledge and the limitations of the way we currently do things. And so when I was in the UK a couple of weeks ago working with the FA, one of the discussions that we had with um, the level three tutors was how would you change the way you approach talent on the field if you assumed that you didn't know anything uh, or assumed that you were terrible at identifying it? Because that's what the evidence actually indicates. How would that change the way you approach this whole um, this whole exercise? Instead of doing what you always do, if you had to rebuild the system, what would you do differently? Part of that is understanding why we might be so poor at identifying talent in the first place. The first is we don't really have good models of what talent is in sport. Um, talent isn't one thing, it's especially in sport. Um, it's a balance of physical, mental, psychological, cognitive, perceptual, it's all of those things. But it's not always high levels of all of those things. If we are if we lack some physical skill, we can make up for it by being better at reading plays or being uh, more mentally tough. And so each person is a unique combination of those things. And so it's hard for us to come up with a one-size-fits-all approach to talent, but that's kind of what we uh, assume is out there. And so my advice is forget about a one-size-fits-all approach to talent. It doesn't exist and it doesn't fit the complexity of what this thing is, especially in a sport that's so dynamic and complex like soccer. The other thing is we have an absence of early indicators of what talent or potential might be. And the reason for that is the things that we use to select performance at younger ages and the things that are important for performance at later ages are not the same things. And so the reason a good performer is, uh, or the reason a good a player is outperforming his peers at the under 11 level could be because they're physically more mature, um, they're just stronger, faster, more capable, um, which is great. But at the adult level, where everybody's strong and fast and capable, those things don't predict anymore. And so, a prediction comes from who's who's uh, better at reading plays, who's better at anticipating, who's who's better at being in the right place at the right time. We also don't have a good understanding of how talent changes across an athlete's development. So this is, um, this is just a simple graph showing the relationship between the time at which we're selecting or making a, a, an evaluation of a person's uh, potential and the time at which we're uh, the, in the future we're predicting. The further away we're making that prediction, the less accurate that prediction is. And so here, here's an example, a, ra a rather, I think, scary example of this. Um, you may have heard of this uh, a couple of years ago. There was It was all over the news, uh, especially CBC Toronto talked about it at, at great length. This study that came out that showed that Based on um, data from your iPhone, they can predict with a 97 or 98 percent accuracy where you're going to be at this time tomorrow. Um, the, the reason for that is we're habitual creatures; we do things in predictable ways, and so um, yeah, it makes sense that tomorrow they could predict roughly where we're going to be because we'll probably be in the same place that we were today. When they start stretching those models out, though, where are you going to be next week, next month, uh, next year, they start to quickly fall apart because we're more complex than that. We're more uh, unpredictable than that. And that's the same way we need to be thinking about talent. We could use performance to predict how well somebody's going to be on the weekend, but predicting how well that same person is going to perform a year from now, uh, five years from now, sometimes 10 years from now, um, those models quickly fall apart because we're too dynamic and too unpredictable. There's also a lot of evidence that the current way we approach athlete development is pretty biased. And some of these you're probably going to be familiar with if you've read books like Malcolm Gladwell's Outliers or The Sports Gene, those kinds of things. Um, some of these are pretty well known and other ones um, hopefully, uh, hopefully you haven't heard of before. So we have system-wide biases, which are things like the relative age effect, um, which you know is based on the idea that we are more likely to choose kids that are 
uh, relatively older in their cohort because um, they look bigger, stronger, faster. They're not. They just look like it because they're they're older and more mature than the people they're being compared with. Similarly, we have some evidence that um, we're more likely to select kids um, and develop them from certain areas of um, geographic size. So uh, the evidence we have here is that it's, it's actually a disadvantage to come from a large metropolitan area like Toronto and that more players come from um, suburban type areas, normally between 50,000 and, and 500,000 seems to be the sweet spot in terms of developing talent. We get way more athletes from those kinds of communities. We're not sure why. It could be maybe parents see them as safer. Maybe, there, maybe there's more parks. Maybe there's less demand on resources. We're not really sure, but the effect is, is pretty significant, especially in Ontario. We also have some evidence that we're more likely to select um, kids from from high socioeconomic stati, uh, status uh, families. So families with more money are more likely to make it uh, through our athlete development pathway. And so these are really biases that we have in the development system that are affecting the um, access to opportunities, but also the likelihood of, of development. There are also some coach related biases, especially around how we think about talent and um, if you've read any of Carol Dweck's work about mindset, uh, that's what we're talking about here. So I said at the beginning of the talk that your beliefs about talent uh, matter. And essentially this work shows that we, we generally fall into one of two camps. We either believe that um, talent is, is, the, is the reflection of an inherited ability that people have that's not, that's not um, changeable, that's relatively fixed. Uh, they either have it or they don't. Uh, and then the second group sees talent and, and uh, performance as something that's acquired over time through hard work and persistence. And so if your belief system is that it's an inherited ability, that, that this is a relatively fixed capacity, well, um, in athletes, this leads to feelings of helplessness when performance doesn't go their way. So think about that athlete who has a negative result and says that, well, I'm just not good at this. Um, well, if that's your fallback perspective, then that's going to affect how you think about training. Um, it's going to negatively affect your learning and your future performance. We see this pretty profoundly in um, uh, certain types of social groups. So we see this with um, females in math, for example. They, there's this social perception that they're less capable in math, uh, and so Oftentimes they have this fixed mindset and they think, well, I'm just not good at that. If you ever hear an athlete or somebody say, well, I'm just not good at that, then that's the definition of a fixed mindset. The opposite is this growth or acquired skill mindset where we see performance that comes from um, hard work and persistence. And so when we have a negative experience, well, we see that as being the result of poor preparation. And so, well, we just need to try harder next time. And so this leads to more satisfaction with the task. Uh, it leads to more persistence and practice. And so from a motivation standpoint, we'd say, well, this one's a bit more positive than the fixed mindset. What's really critical, though, is recognizing that neither of these is 100% correct. Right. The, the, the idea that there is some fixed level of potential and that anybody who tries hard enough is not necessarily going to become a Gretzky or a Mozart or a, or a, a, a Monet. It's, it, there are certain people um, who have greater potential um, uh, to succeed and that we need to accommodate both of these perspectives and the way that we think about talent. From a coaching perspective, though, most of our messages should be promoting this idea of talent as an acquired uh, capacity or skill level as an acquired capacity. The way we interact with our athletes influences the way we think about their own, the way they think about their own skills, but it also could bias our evaluation of them. And the reason why I put this conclusion up here is because of all the experiments that have looked at fixed versus growth mindsets on uh, motivation and learning, 
the way that they manipulate this is through the teacher or the instructor. And so coaches have a lot of power in influencing the way their athletes think about their skills by the words that they use. And so if you're using words like you're a natural at that or um, you made that look so easy, well, you might be reinforcing a fixed mindset in your athletes compared to, hey, you're working really hard and, and emphasizing these things from a more growth perspective. One of the things we're exploring right now is whether the way coaches make um, decisions about talent might also be related to um, cognitive biases just in the way our brains process information. Uh, we have a big experimental research program looking at this right now. And one of the interesting things that came not from sport but from, uh, from education is this notion of the naturalism bias, which is basically – um, if we were to ask coaches uh, or teachers, what's more important to me, somebody who works hard or somebody who's a natural, most people would say, well, the hard worker is the more important person to have in your group. But when they have to make selections about who's got more potential, they almost always go with the person who seems to have natural ability. And so this is that bias where we say we value something, but when we have to make a decision about it, we do the opposite. And so we're exploring whether there are other biases just in the way we process information that might affect why we're so poor at identifying talent. And then we have a whole group of biases that are related to the athlete. Uh, and so, for example, there's this consistent bias that um, that white sprinters are, are uh, inferior to sprinters that come from uh, West Africa in that white distance runners are inferior to distance runners who trace their lineage to East Africa. Um, that's a really powerful stereotype that has no scientific evidence to support it whatsoever. But think about the power of that belief system on a person's performance. And so there's a really interesting study that brought athletes into a, uh, into a gym in Arizona and had them perform um, a vertical jump test. And these were all white athletes. They were told, half of the group was told, just do the jump. And the other half of the group was told, do the jump because we're going to compare your scores to black athletes because we're interested in looking at differences between racial groups. Well, the only thing that changed was the way the test was framed and the group that was told their tests were going to be compared to black scores had lower scores than the other group. And so this is the power of these biases. They affect performance. They affect our approaches to training. They affect our motivation for doing different types of tasks. Uh, and so all of these biases affect the accuracy of our talent selection processes. So how do we improve? Well, that's recognizing the, the limitations of our current knowledge and our current approaches. The next thing is understand the implications and the risks associated with that process. So we've started to do this by understanding the consequences of dropout during those early stages of development. Um, maybe we need to do a better job following up and making sure as many people are staying involved as, as, uh, as possible uh, so that we have some follow-up for those people and it's easier for them to re-engage with the system later. One of the things that we've done in our lab through working with high performance coaches across the Canadian sports system is really trying to unpack this idea of risk uh, in talent selection. And so we've designed a matrix that helps us understand different levels of risk when we're looking at different athletes. And so um, based on the idea that not all decisions have the same level of risk. And so this is a simple matrix. Um, what we're trying to do is predict potential most of the time, because we don't have good indicators of potential, we're left looking at performance. How is a per person performing relative to the rest of their comparison group? And so if we use these two things on a, basically on a continuum, we can design uh, a matrix that looks like this. Person in the box number one is a person with low potential and low performance. A uh, person in box number nine is a person that has high potential and is currently demonstrating high performance. And then we got the people in the uh, across the rest of that continuum. 
What's interesting about this, though, is if we think about our players from this perspective, when we think about what box do they belong in, it can help us make more informed decisions about performance um, and 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 potential. So, for ex let's talk through a couple of examples. So, people in box number one and box number nine are not really a risk um, for us because the person with low performance and low potential is going to get removed from the system. The person with high performance and high potential is going to stay in the system because we're no, most of the time we're looking at performance as our indicator of potential. So those people are relatively safe. That's our low risk groups. Medium risk are the ones in the yellow boxes there, the ones that are average, um, average performance or average potential because in high performance sport, average is not going to be good enough, right? We want the exceptional uh, performer um, uh, because that's what the system re requires. We're not going to make it to the to the elite level or to the professional level if we're just an average uh, performer. And so the risk for this group is that they take up space or they um, uh, take opportunities away from those people who have more potential um, uh, to be in the system. So we would consider them kind of a medium risk group. The highest level of risk though are boxes seven and eight and box number three. Box number three is high risk because they're, person, they're that person who has uh, currently a really high level of performance, but their potential for improvement uh, and success in the future is really low. So the likelihood is that person's going to stay in the system and take a spot away from uh, someone else who has greater potential. Boxes seven and eight are a risk because if all we're doing is looking at performance to make our decisions about selection, then the likelihood is those people are going to be removed from the system because they have current low and medium uh, levels of performance. And so the risk here is we're going to lose talent um, because our decision is based too much on current level of performance uh, and not on um, trying to measure potential. I don't want to talk too much about this because it can get a little bit complicated. I know my grad students find this complicated, so we'll try to keep it as uh, as simple as we can. What we're really dealing with in that matrix is what we call a type 1 versus a type 2 error. A type 1 error is assuming that somebody's talented and keeping them in the system when they actually aren't, which is our box number 3. Um, the false negative, our type 2 error, is, is box 7 and 8. Uh, where we think they don't have potential, but they actually do, and we've deselected them. And so from a coaching standpoint, um, you need to get comfortable with what type of error uh, you will accept. Uh, this will depend on the goals of your program, how many, how much resources you have available. Um, I know in sports, we've worked with some sports uh, in the Paralympic system where they get to keep everybody because the number of people they have in their system is so low, they need to fill space. Uh, because they need to have people for the elite team to play against. They need to um, uh, they need to have people that can uh, the, that can fill drills and and things like that. Soccer doesn't have that problem. It has the opposite problem, which is so many people that want to be part of the system. I would say the more important error here is to make sure that you're not deselecting talent from the system and in and uh, incorporating a type two error. That's probably the more important one for us from a soccer standpoint. Another thing that we can do, because the evidence um, currently about talent selection and, and the accuracy of those decisions is so negative and so poor, well, the, that means the door is wide open for us to plot a path to improvement. And when I say it's wide open, there's no, um, no organization in the world that is doing this well. Right. When I was in the um, in the UK working with the FA, you would think if it's, if this was a question that could be answered by money, uh, the FA would have the answer. But they don't. There's no there's nowhere in the world that's really doing a good job of um, talent selection and talent identification. And the reason is um, is uh, those things that we already talked about: lack of appropriate models, um, not looking in the right place. And we'll talk about that in a couple of slides. But it's a real opportunity for coaches to rethink the, the way that they're, uh, they're approaching this problem. So part of that, from our perspective, is appropriate research. 
So tracking athletes uh, longitudinally, um, evaluating accuracy. Most coaches I know are somewhat obsessive about keeping data sets of their players. Well, if you've got years of data, how, um, how often do you go back to that data to track and see uh, how accurate it was at making those selections? Right? If we rarely, in a research standpoint, have access to the kinds of data that you guys uh, have and oftentimes take for granted. And so if it's a question of getting someone to help you analyze that, well, let us know or, or contact your you know, local college or local high school. There'll be people there that can help you answer those questions. And it just might make your approaches uh, more evidence-based and more accurate. So how do we go about developing that? Um, effective system. The first thing is think about what you're going to measure. Most people have those standard combine-like tests that they use for measuring um, athletes' uh, performance and, and assuming potential from that. These are mostly physical and physiological outcomes, but I would say that people are already looking there, and, and you've probably already looked there. And um, So if everybody's looking there, the potential is not into uh, is not to be doing the thing that everyone else is doing. The potential is to look where no one else is looking. Uh, and so from our perspective, I would say um, start to explore things like psychological uh, factors, self-regulation, resiliency, mental toughness, anxiety under pressure. there's you know there's countless number of psychological variables related to long-term athlete development and performance uh, and start to think about, well, how could this, um, uh, how could this predict um, potential? And the one that we're um, really focused on these days is self-regulation. Self-regulation is that that athlete who shows up ready to train every day because they've thought about the drills, they've thought about how to, you know, how do I squeeze a, an extra bit of learning out of out of this training session. Um, self-regulation is a great predictor of success uh, in longitudinal studies that have been done over the past five years. And the reason is the person who's self-regulated takes control of their own learning. They don't have to be uh, pushed by the coach to, to do another set or to do another drill. They don't have to be dragged out of bed by their parents. They're the ones doing the dragging. And so if we think about development from a, you know, who's going to stick around and, and get the most out of training for the next five years, 10 years, whatever that time span is, um, self-regulation could be a great predictor of that. Um, so we're stopped looking at predictors of performance, and now we're looking at predictors of uh, long-term persistence. We could also look at perceptual cognitive things, which are very rarely considered. So how early could we identify somebody who's going to develop into a great decision maker? Um, the, the really uh, interesting concept that's being explored these days, especially with soccer goaltenders, is this thing called the quiet eye, which is uh, it's really about the stability of a person's gaze when they when they see someone about to kick a ball. How stable is that? Uh, and the more stable it is, seems to be indication uh, an indicator of success. Um, so, exploring these kinds of things, which have really never been thought of as indicators of talent or potential, uh, might hold important keys to to, uh, to improving the whole process. The second question is, when's the best time to measure it? So a couple of years ago, I was part of a research group with the rugby football union uh, in the UK, and we came up with this position statement that um, that they followed. Hands, uh, hats off to them because they changed their whole system so that they would delay measurement and selection till as late as possible, preferably into the post-adolescent period. And so they said, Anybody who's a club associated and affiliated with the RFU will, won't do any selections till at least 15 years of age. And so that fundamentally changed how they developed players in, in uh, rugby union. Uh, the FA is, has put a similar position uh, statement in place for how they think about selection of uh, developing young soccer players in the UK. The difference between the two systems, though, is the FA – um, can do they can put out a position statement but if the professional clubs don't choose to adopt that position statement then nothing changes which is essentially what happened there the elite uh, pre-academies have decided they're still going to 
select athletes at seven, eight, nine years of age. So think about those things in terms of when's the best time to measure decision making, when's the best time to measure self-regulation or persistence or mental toughness. Um, is this something that we've given enough time for it to develop uh, naturally through training? We probably don't want to develop or we probably don't want to measure mental toughness in seven year olds because they haven't had enough time in sport to develop that capacity. Um, but can we measure it in 13 year olds or 14 year olds? Um, that's a different type of question. How are you going to measure it? <clears throat> so in research, we talk about um, the snapshot approach, which is what we call cross-sectional, where we just measure it at one point in time and, and, and try to relate that to a performance outcome uh, versus something we call longitudinal approach, which is track uh, an athlete over a longer period of time and actually measure the accuracy. And clearly, the longitudinal approach is better, but it doesn't mean that we only have to use that approach. We can get good evidence from cross-sectional um, uh, approaches as well. It's also critical that we use valid and reliable indicators. So do the tests that we're using on the field actually relate to the concept that we're trying to measure? If you're doing a dribbling drill a across a bunch of cones, well, um, what is that thing supposed to measure and how accurately does it do that? It measures how good somebody can dribble around a bunch of cones, but what's that supposed to be a proxy of? Is that supposed to be the, their ability to dynamically move the ball during a game situation? Well, how do we make that more valid? Well, maybe we add, um, we add a player in there. Maybe we add some more dynamic uh, nature to the way those cones are moving. Um, that makes that test a bit more valid. So those things will be what we call objective tests. Um, they, they're, they're the same for everybody. We know that they're um, reliable from one point to the next. And we often compare those to what we call subjective tests, like the coaches I, coaches who say, um, you know, I, I can't tell you what talent is, but I know it when I see it. And oftentimes we dismiss those kinds of um, uh, perspectives. But I think there's a lot there. People um, who have a lot of experience in a sport um, may actually see something. They're just not able to verbalize what it is. And so we, we need to evaluate those kinds of things as well, even if it's just to say, you know what, the, the objective tests are better. Right now we have no idea what is a better test because we just haven't done the, we haven't done the research. So the conclusion that we came to here is that in the short term we want to use the approach that will get you good data in the most feasible way, but always be look, uh, looking towards moving or working towards that longitudinal data set. So uh, looking at players across multiple years if possible, creating a community of coaches at different levels so that you can track and, and compare data sets. All of these things are opportunities that you could use to build a better uh, understanding of talent and how it changes over time and how good your decisions were at, at trying to um, uh, evaluate it. The other thing that I would suggest is uh, better engagement with researchers, not just researchers like me at the university system, but researchers um, in exercise science classes in the high school level, or if it is with people like me or graduate students, um, that you establish reciprocal relationships. A lot, oftentimes what researchers do is they have a great research question, they parachute in and get data from you and your team. Uh, or with MAD and, and uh, Soccer Ontario, and then they parachute back out. And that's not really a good relationship for you guys on, on your end. And so make sure that that's reciprocal. Uh, and we're trying to do that now with the work that we're doing with the Canadian sports system is we come in with our research question and, and, and we say, hey, we're interested in this. And then the next question is, what are you guys interested in and how can we help? Uh, and I think that's a much better uh, relationship to build. It builds those bridges between the research community and the, the practitioners. Um, one of the things that we might try to do is, uh, is develop a, um, a situation where, we, yeah, we do the research and we write our research article, but when we write that article, we also write a practitioner-based article um, that would go out to the, to the membership. Um, that's just part of the uh, cost of doing business with 
um, with uh, with coaches like yourselves and access to your players. And so build that in so that there's a constant uh, increase and in evolution in your understanding based on researchers doing their thing, but you guys doing your thing as high performance coaches and progressive uh, progressive learners. So um, with that, I have no idea of our time. I feel like I raced through that, but um, um, we have lots of time for questions. And uh, so I'll just say thank you. This was fun. Um, if you have any other questions or if you want any other research that we talked about today, um, this is what my lab and I do all day long. We talk about questions to do with how do we maximize athlete potential and performance. And so follow me on Twitter, send me an email. Uh, I'm happy to send any of the research that we talked about today. And if you just want to um, talk about questions you have, feel free to drop me a line. So thanks. Thank you, Joe. So this opportunity now for you to send in any questions you may have and keep the conversation going. We're more than happy to stay alive. Give you a few more minutes to send any questions you may have, and then we'll begin answering them. So we have a question here from Dave Kaplan, and it's, what are the best measurements for keeping track of player performance? Yeah, I think, you know, the I th the people online are probably a better um, uh, better to answer that question than I would be because I think it requires a bit of knowledge about the sport. I would say, um, I would say we probably don't know what that question is, but it requires uh, a bit of thinking and a bit of evaluation. You know, we, the thing that coaches do great is they're creative and they are always trying out new ideas on the field. And that's fantastic from a research standpoint though, if that's not being evaluated, uh, and measuring it against the way that things were done in the past and, and you know, kind of determining which one's a better fit, which one's more accurate, those kinds of things, then we really don't know. And so to answer your question, which ones are the best, I would say we have no idea yet because nobody's really done enough testing and evaluation of the things out there already. Um, and that's the reason why we see the perpetuation of things like the, you know, the NFL Combine where they're doing – things that are obviously irrelevant to, uh, to, to being a, a you know, gridiron football player, but they still do it. They still put money into it every year, and it's because nobody's done the due diligence of evaluating those things to see really uh, are they actually good measures of what they're supposed to be measuring. Thanks. We have another question here from Palma Petrelli, and it's, do you have a list of talent identification tests that are done at the Canada soccer level as well as globally? Are there any benchmarks available today for talent ID in Canada? There might be, a, you know, the, um, Jason uh, DeVos is probably the guy to contact uh, for that. I know that um, I know in, in the UK when we were there talking to the FA, each academy has their own set of um, uh, skills and drills that they would they would measure performance on, and they kind of keep that stuff hush hush uh, from a you know a secrecy standpoint. So I don't know that there's a standardized measure, but coming up, you know, the thing that's interesting to me is coming up with a standardized approach to talent ID, and then getting great buy-in from coaches across the country where they're measuring their their athletes on it. Uh, we're testing these things out and we're, you know, we're looking at which ones are better and which ones are garbage. And uh, from one year to the next, it's an evolving process until we get to a point where we're like, yeah, this is the Canadian talent development and, and selection battery. Um, using a, the community of coaches across Canada, for me, that's such an exciting idea um, because coaches want to be doing work that uh, that makes sense, that's evidence-based, that they can be proud of. Uh, so I think it's we just need somebody who's who's going to be able to to build that momentum. I think it'll come. So uh, if we don't do it, a country is going to beat us to it. Um, and so for me, it's all about you know how do we take advantage of this vacuum of no good talent identification research and uh, and practice out there? How do we how do we be the ones that lead the world in this capacity? Um, because like I said earlier. There is no, there's nobody out there who's doing this well.
Another question from Charlene O'Connor. Do you have a sense of possible gender differences in predictors of future performance or talent? We haven't really explored the gender or sex differences in, in these kinds of predictors because, you know, from our perspective, um, there's a pretty good evidence base that we need to be looking at people as individual learners. And um, so we look at, you know, whether it's a para-athlete or a, a female soccer player or a male basketball player, we kind of look at it. Um, from a, what's the best approach that we can take with this person given their specific individual needs uh, as opposed to a one-size-fits-all strategy. And I know that, you know, on the podium and, and the uh, national governing bodies really are big on these uh, one-size-fits-all developmental models. Um, and I think there's a need for that. But I think for me the more important thing is understanding the noise or the nuance around these kind of general approaches um, so that we can be better at designing appropriate uh, instruction, appropriate environments for these athletes to develop. And my other hat that I wear is um, not from a talent perspective, but from a skill acquisition perspective is how do we design better training environments? And so for me, that I always come to this from that perspective is, you know, these things are an individual type of question. And so there probably are differences, big, broad differences between what we would look for in a male soccer player versus a female soccer player. But for me, the individual nuance is the more important element. Another question from Lynn. Do you engage in knowledge translation work to get the research messages out to parents as well? Yeah, we try to do that. And a couple of the ways we do that, we write popular articles. I don't know if anybody here follows the um, CERC is the Sport Information Resource Center, and they have a, um, a magazine that comes out, I think, three or four times a year, and it's basically high-performance research uh, summarized for coaches and practitioners. It's called Circuit, uh, and so we've written a couple pieces for there. We've also um, edited and written a couple of books that are designed for coaches as opposed to you know, stuffy science uh, reviews. These ones are actually designed from a Okay, this is this is what perceptual cognitive training is, uh, and here's how we present it to a coach so that they can understand and, and put that into practice. So we've done a couple of books in that area. Um, we're trying to design one right now that would be specifically for parents because I think um, they've been essentially ignored as um, as uh, opportunities for maximizing athlete development. Um, we think about the coach, we think about the athlete, we think about the the trainer, the the strength and conditioning person. We very rarely think, well, how do we how do we um, operationalize the parents in this equation? Uh, and so we're trying to explore that as well. So it's a great question. Yeah, we're we're trying to get there. Um, there's a couple people in the UK that have done work in this area. If, if you're interested, just shoot me an email. I'm happy to to send that info on. Another question here from Luis de Medeiros. Given your comments on persistence and effort versus fixed natural ability, is there a time relationship to how long the potential can be given to achieve the higher performance levels? Yeah, that's really the million dollar question, right? Like we always want to know, um, and you know, if I had to, and, and I've had to do this, parents will come and say, I, I want to know if my, if my child is talented or not. And I, I always say, well, you know, are they enjoying what most of the time are they enjoying what they're doing are they excited to train are they interested in this um, well then you probably have as good an indicator of talent as we have right if they're if they're going to stick around for thousands of hours and um, uh, and and you know a dozen years that it takes to develop into an elite soccer player well we, we can probably see early indicators of that in enjoyment and and motivation and persistence very early on uh, that doesn't mean it's the only thing, but if you don't have that, you know, we call it the currency of skill acquisition. If you don't have that, then it's almost impossible for someone to give that to you. Uh, and so, you know, I think we've done a lot of work with the concept of deliberate practice, and, and, and I like that as an approach. I don't think it's the be-all and the end-all, but I think that we can, you know, the more that we can get people to train in the best environments, um, with the right kind of effort and the right kind of uh, purpose, um, we can we can help them uh, learn better. And so uh, I think there is a time element to it. But you know, we did a study with 
um, elite Ironman level triathletes a few years ago, and we found that the variance between people who got to the same point in performance was about 10,000 hours. So, um, you know, the, the time isn't the timing isn't the only thing, um, but it's a it's a critical it's definitely a critical piece. So that's it for questions, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending tonight. It's been fantastic having you here with Dr. Joe Baker and myself, Matt Ferreira, Regional Manager for Player Development. Look forward to seeing everyone out on our next few webinars, and this one will be posted up shortly online. Uh, just keep following us on Twitter. Uh, follow Dr. Joe Baker on Twitter as well, and shoot him any follow-up email questions that you may have. Thank you again, and have a great night and great weekend.